the mic. A few of you will have heard him speaking already and uh, having a good chat before the meeting started. Mike has done us a great favour of stepping in to do this talk when our, our pre-arranged Lycan speaker couldn't make it. But I think we've fallen on our feet here. Um, Mike seems to know a bit about everything. He's uh, a senior curator in Northern Ireland at the Natural History Museum. He's got three fossils actually named after him, would you believe? <laughs> Found his first fossil at the age of six, but as well as fossils, he seems to have all sorts of interests, meteorites recently. Um, but he's also got a really good knowledge of lichens and he quite often comments on the Scottish lichens Facebook um, group, which is how I managed to track him down. You'll probably wish he didn't do it now. <laughs> um, so although he was brought up in England, he's worked in Wales, he's now in Northern Ireland. And he's got a really broad knowledge of lots of natural history aspects. But tonight he's going to delight us with what he's knows about lichens or what he knows that's suitable for beginners because let's face it they're probably nearly all beginners um it's not the most i wouldn't say popular of subjects it's not the most easy of subjects and people don't always get started but perhaps after mike's talk you might be tempted to go out and have a little look yourself so i will mute myself now and hand over to mike Right, now I'll do the sharing screen. Oh, uh, yes. Ah, I've I you disabled attendee screen sharing. Uh, is that? Audrey, that's the security shield. Yes. Oh, right. Oh, that looks better, doesn't it? Should be okay now. Yes, splendid, splendid. Right, okay, right. Hopefully you can all see and hear me. Um, uh, yeah, so lichens, uh, some of you said that uh, you don't necessarily know very much about lichens. Well, I didn't. If you go back 30 years uh, or so, I really knew very little at all about them. So I'm very aware of what a difficult group they can actually be to, to deal with. And this is really, it's very similar talk I gave at the Caithness International Science Festival back in March, which actually um, still recorded. So if you want to go back over this one again, you can, you can uh, do so. So well, the thing about lichens is that they're a bit of a sort of Cinderella group in that not that many people are terribly keen on them. So they often get lumped together with what a commonly called lower plants um, and so things like ferns and mosses and grasses all the things that there's not a huge number of people interested in them they all get lumped in the same book so you've got roger phillips grasses ferns mosses which are plants and lichens which are not plants and then ferns mosses which are plants and lichens which aren't plants so that's the thing they're grouped with these other things but they're not actually part plants so they shouldn't really be in there uh, at all they're actually fungi and um, this is a book by a guy called George Massey, uh, published around 1910. He recognised that, that they are fungi, and so they should be included in a book about fungi. So he wrote this book, British uh, Fungi and Lichens. But they're fungi, and they live in partnership with algae. And these are, uh, this is a, an alga that you quite often see in sort of damp sort of areas, thing called nostoc. It's the sort of thing you slip on, you know, grows all over the paths and things like that. And so that's one of the algae that is actually involved with, with, uh, with lichens. So they're not a single organism. That's one of the key things to take away. And it's, I think, quite well known that they are a, a symbiosis. Uh, and it's a, it's, a, it's a partnership or symbiosis between uh, an alga and a fungus. And in fact, the fungi have almost discovered agriculture. So what they're doing is they're nurturing algal cells enveloped within fungal hyphae. So this is like a, a diagrammatic cross-section of what it might look like with all the sort of the fungal hyphae here forming a sort of mesh, forming a, a very distinct sort of upper surface quite often. And in just below 
that surface and lots and lots of algal cells. You've got to have them fairly near the surface because, of course, they've got to be able to receive light. So you can't have them too deeply embedded because the light won't get down there because they need light to photosynthesize. And here it is, you've got the algal cells sort of being almost like cuddled by the, the fungal hyphae. And of course, what's happening is that the, the algae are busy photosynthesizing. So they're producing sugars from uh, uh, water and carbon dioxide. And the fungus is acting as a, as, is protecting these algal cells from um, drying out in, in very, very dry weather. It's, it's a sort of giving them protection and also uh, anchoring them to a sort of substrates because the fungal hyphae can attach to rocks, trees, uh, or, or whatever. So the fungus, uh, as, a, as almost like part of the payment uh, for, for this service of protecting these things, actually will take some of the, the sugars that the uh, algae are producing. So it's a very beneficial partners, partnership for both. The fungus gets uh, nutrients and the alga um, uh, gets protection and anchorage from <clears throat> being blown away or, or whatever. I look at a few lichen shapes, they come in all sorts of uh, uh, different shapes. And the main ones you get what I've called, they have rather kind of fancy names. So these are officially called fruticose, but they're better called shrubby lichens because that's what they look like. So you've got these long sort of, you've got an anchor point there and you, then you've got various little discs here and I'll talk about those in a little bit. Then you've got leafy lichens or folios lichens, which well, leafy as the name suggests. Um, Stringy lichens, uh, this thing called usnea, which is uh, literally looks like string. And in fact, some of them have a quite tough sort of stringy bit down the middle of these rather thicker th strings. It'll have a thinner bit down the middle. Then crusty lichens, which as their name suggests are encrusted. They're very closely attached to the sort of surface of the rock or tree bark or wood, whatever. So there's a crust of lichens. And then these types, which I've just called tuby lichens, or not tuby, terrible joke. But um, and these are things like uh, the Cladonias, which is the devil. This is the devil's matchstick. And they've also got things called reindeer lichens here, which are more sort of branching. And you also get things called pixie cups. There's a little pixie cup down there. And so these are the sort of main kind of morphologies you see of lichens. And you can see these have got sort of these red blobs on the top. And this, uh, where's that? The little one there, the little pixie cup, little dots on there. This has got little sort of circular bits there. And, oh, um, anyway, I'll get back to those. Those are sort of discs that are to do with how they disperse. And in fact, most lichens are, are belong to the group that we call jelly fungi or ascomycetes. Uh, and so there's lots of them, scarlet elf cup and green elf cup and things like that are sort of very well known examples. And there's also a group called the basidiomycetes, which are the toadstools and mushrooms. And this of course is the fly agaric, but most lichens are actually the ascomycetes. It's a few lichens do actually have little toastals that they produce as the fruiting bodies. And uh, these structures are the ones that produce spores and the spores are how fungi are uh, dispersed to new locations because spores are ridiculously tiny so they can be blown around in the wind, be produced in, in vast numbers um, and blown around over huge distances. So some lichens and some fungi are very widespread because of that. And of the ascomycetes, about 40% of the ascomycete fungi are in fact lichenized. That is, they share, uh, they have a partnership with an alga. So it's not such an unusual thing to say lichens are just an unusual sort of ascomycete. It's actually a fairly, fairly mainstream thing to do if you're one of these jelly fungi. So how do lichens spread? Remember on the, the slide, a couple of pictures back when I was showing you the various discs and things, and you've got um, a lot of lichens have these, these disc-like structures, which are called apothecia, but you can just call them kind of discs or fruiting bodies. And these produce the algal spores. And you can see some more here. So this is the main part of the sort of the, the, the sort of fungal thallus with, this, with the algal cells in it, in this sort of background. And these little bodies here are there to produce fungal spores. And there's more producing fungal spores. This is one of my favorite lichens, Ophia palma. Ventosa. And one of the problems with lichens is that they um, they mostly have rather horrible names. I'm very used to that in names, but most people aren't. So um, that can sometimes be a bit tricky. 
So we've got uh, structures that produce fungal spores on lichens, and they're very sort of widespread, these structures. And that's all very well, but what about the algal cells? Because to make a lichen, you be, need both an alga and uh, a fungus. What is a, lo lo a lonely lichen spore to do when it lands somewhere? Well, it turns out that there is plenty of algae out there already living quite independently um, on all sorts of substrates, on trees and barks and um, rocks and paving slabs. Um, so you have to <laughs> clean them off. So this is just sort of one of them. This is a green alga called Pleurococcus, very, very sort of common. Uh, and this is another one that's incredibly common as well, a thing called Trantopolia. And it's also a green alga, though you wouldn't think so to, to look at it. And these are actually common partners within um, within the lichen partnership. But whereas there are about, well, in Britain now, in the UK now, there's probably 1,500 species of lichen that are known. And most of those will have a quite separate species of or fungal partner. But of the alga, there's probably only about 20 or so species of algae that are used again and again and again in the partnership. So it's different species of fungi actually partnering up with just a relatively small pool of, of algae that they use. So, um, so these algae are really very, very common and widespread, which is why the, the lichens can use this uh, method of just scattering fungal spores all over the place and hope that they actually find a suitable alga to partner up with. But say so the, the algal, uh, the fungal spores come from these discs and you need to find the algal cells. And this is a cross section of the disc and you can see these little things here. These are called ASCII, which is why these fungi are called as, uh, ascomycetes. And that's where the spores are produced in these, in these discs. But some lichens actually produce powdery patches. They're called cerealia, but just think of them as these powdery patches. You can see all this sort of powder over them. And that powder is actually a mixture of algal cells and a few bits of fungal hyphae. So these can be kind of blown about by the wind or animals can brush past them or whatever. And so they can actually disperse very, very effectively. And effectively, it's an instant lichen kit. So as soon as it lands, it's got both of the components and it can sort of set about getting itself um, settled in as it were. A lot of lichens produce either these discs, the apothecia, and produce only fungal spores, or they produce only the cerealia, produce these powdery patches, which are a mix of uh, uh, fungal bits and algal bits. But some, as in this example here, Fissia tonella, they can produce both. Um, so, you know, it's belt and braces really. So, uh, but, but both are really, pretty effective ways of getting around uh, as proven by the fact that they are very, very widespread on um, lichens. So where do you actually find them? Well, you find them all over the place. You find them on all sorts of different substrates, all sorts of different habitats and numeral locations. And I've just picked out four of those 1500 um, to just give an example, you know, a, a flavor of the sorts of different uh, habitats and substrates that you you find them in. Um, there's quite a few actually that um, if you show maps it'll just be one or two dots and it'll be Ben Laws. Ben Laws is fantastic for a whole range of lichens that are found nowhere else in Britain so I wasn't going to use those. What I would thought I'd do is show you a classic um, coastal lichen. There are a whole assemblage of lichens that are really common and conspicuous on rocky shores. And they're a really good place to actually get to know, uh, get familiar with a few lichens because there are some quite nice publications which deal with these seashore lichens. And this one is called Ramalina siliquosa. And you can see it very definitely is a coastal thing. It's all around the rocky coast. But when you get over to here, where the, the coasts are a bit, bit shoddy, frankly, aren't they? They're sort of all sort of soft, sandy stuff. So you're not really finding very much. That one there is almost certainly on a gravestone in a, in a churchyard somewhere in, in Suffolk. Um, but also you can see, you know, it's coastal. And then there's a few sort of odd ones sort of in the middle there. And I'll come back to that in a bit. You think, what's that doing in there? Some of these coastal lichens are exclusively coastal and some are not quite as exclusively coastal as you would think. 
Then you've got these upland rocks, siliceous upland rocks, granite, sandstone, quartzite, and things like that. You get this beautiful Ophia palma ventosa, and it really likes cold upland places. It's really a sort of, a, it's an Arctic type thing. So you see it a lot up in the highlands and the northern Pennines and such like, but you're never going to ever going to see it down here. And we rarely see it in, in Northern Isle, a little bit up in Donegal, tiny bit down in the Bourne Mountains. Then uh, this is one that grows on trees and it likes it wet. It likes the uh, temperate rainforest. So you see it's doing really, really well in Western Scotland, which is fantastic for, for these temperate rainforest lichens. And really it's, you hardly see it anywhere uh, else. You know, there's a few bits down the West coast of Ireland, West coast of Wales. And then finally, at the end of the scale, one that really likes it dry and sunny, a uh, thing called Calaplaca arantia. And it's found on limestone. And, and so a lot of these will actually be on headstones in churchyards and they'll be south facing headstones in uh, churchyards or east facing headstones. Um, so very much uh, a different sort of distribution. So you can see just taking four there, we've got very, very distri different distributions which are reflecting uh how wet it is how sunny it is how warm it is the uh, there. Uh, somebody's charles bateman Hello. is that charles Right, I'll continue. I don't know what was that about. Yeah, I'm not sure what happened there. No, there's, uh, there's uh, things sent to try us. Anyway, so that gives you an overview of. Um, lots of different lichens, different habitats. So different places you would find come across different things. And one of the things about lichens I often say is that lichens colour the world. And you say, well, not really. Well, they do, because very often you don't actually see what the rock really looks like, what its colour is, which is why as geologists we carry a hammer around so we can knock a piece off and see what a fresh surface uh, looks like. So this is over in the west of Ireland, coastal rocks. And, and all this black here, that's the sort of lichen over there. And you can see these orange patches and white patches and lots of these green ramelina siliquosa. So they really do add color to what uh, would otherwise, well, as a geologist, I think it would be fantastic anyway. But a lot of people would say, well, it look a bit dull without all these colors. Um, and some of the colors are really very, very striking indeed. These are um, up in actually Northeast Scotland, uh, I think near Abernathy. Uh, this beautiful thing called Chrysothix chlorina. This is uh, my Ophia palma ventosa again. Another one there, Rhizocarpum geographicum. So they're much, much more colourful than the bryophytes. The bryophytes are various shades of green and occasionally get a bit of red or whatever. But lichens have a much greater range of, of colours. And these are due to lichen chemicals. They are kind of unique um, chemicals found within the lichens which give them these distinctive colors uh, and they also impart distinctive uh, chemical reactions which i'll say a little bit about in a, in a minute but of course these chemicals lichen chemicals have have not really been investigated sort of very much but you wonder they could have all sorts of medicinal uses perhaps um something where there needs to be a lot more sort of work i think done to find out what these might be used for but these are chemicals unique to to lichens. And uh, this is a local hero, a local to me, uh, Matilda Knowles. She was born in Ballymena in County Antrim in 1864. And she was the first person to really recognise that there's a distinct colour zonation on rocky shores. And this is actually, this is an, an apple cross, it's a boulder and apple cross, so it's quite a sheltered sort of uh, lock here. And the lower part is covered with a, a black lichens various species like Vericaria maura, uh, Vericaria striatula and such like. And above that is an orange zone, which is species of Caloplaca, um, Caloplaca uh, marina, Caloplaca thalincula. And then above that um, is a, what's called the gray zone. And it contains a, a much more diverse range of, of lichens, some of which are mostly coastal, but some of which you can expect to find 
further inland. There's a little bit of orange there of Xanthoe peritone. So this black, orange, gray zonation is characteristic of rocky shores. And she was the first person to recognize this. And you will see it all around Britain's coasts and far beyond. And here in, in Apple Cross, it's nice and sheltered. So you've got the whole thing within one boulder. But if you went up to sort of, you know, Shetlands and Orkney or whatever, where it can be quite rough at times, you might see this zonation stretched out vertically over perhaps 10 or 20 meters. You'll see the black zone extending way, way above uh, high water because it's subjected to uh, you know, much more extreme wave conditions. So, uh, yeah, so there, there are local heroes uh, dealing with lichens as well. And something as obvious as that, but it, it took somebody like her to actually recognize that this is actually significant. And then you look at trees, this is an oak tree, and you think, well, what colour is the bark? It's actually very difficult to tell because it's covered with all manner of, of lichens, sort of greys and browns. There's some little orangey bits here, a thing called Xanthoria ucranica. Um, so there's a little bit of colour there. But remember I was saying about the lichens have their own sort of unique uh, lichen chemicals within them, and we can actually use that to actually test to identify particular lichens using common uh, chemical tests. So in the case of here, this is a lichen called Purchasaria cocodes, again, horrible name. And I've just had a little drop of potassium hydroxide and what it does it with, it reacts with the, the chemicals within that lichen to produce this kind of bright red color. And so that is characteristic with looking at the sort of the shape of it and the texture on the surface. And that red dot tells me it's purchasary cocodes. And there's another chemical, um, sodium hypochlorite or bleach, but it has to be very cheap bleach. You don't want to buy the expensive stuff because that you quite often contain sodium hydroxide. You want really, really cheap water bleach. And that is another test that we use very commonly to identify, help us to identify lichens. And this gives them the edge over, over bryophytes where you don't have recourse to these tests because bryophytes don't have these sort of range of unique chemical so so that map may, look, may not look all that colorful but when you add the sort of chemicals they can and this one here is bright yellow but uh, there are others some that change when you add potassium hydroxide these will turn purple and others that don't change at all so it's a way of distinguishing those and of course those same chemicals and the effects of sort of uh, other chemicals on them means that lichens can actually be used for for dyeing um, and there have been been known for a long time, this is probably sometime in the Middle Ages, some chap uh, he's dunking these kind of wool into a, a, a cauldron of um, oh. Sorry. Oh. my phone's gone. Um, so anyway, so that's uh, a chap in the Middle Ages, so it was used as a way of dyeing sort of cloth. There are books today, it's one called Lichen Dyes. Um, it's so a range of different sort of colors you can get from different uh, lichens. You see, as in Rubicunda and Palmatrim and Arnoldia. So they give different colors. And of course, Harris Tweed is uh, colored using uh, lichen dyes. And this is Morag scraping lichens off the rocks of the Outer Hebrides, probably. So it was a way that people actually imparted color to, to their clothing. But one of the downsides of it is that a lot of these colors are, are rather fugitive in bright sunlight. So they will fade if you wear them in bright sunlight a lot, but that may not be so much of a problem in the Outer Hebrides. Okay, lichens also, to my mind, and this is something I'm very passionate about, is that lichens impart a sense of age to, um, to rocks and, and buildings and such like. This is a place called Devonish Island in County Fermanagh, and this is an early Christian site. So it's about a thousand years old, and there's a, a couple of small monitors, and there's a round tower, such like. And you can see these buildings, which are made of mainly kind of limestone blocks, and there's some sandstone here. And so this was carved the best part of a thousand years ago, but it's got this mosaic of different sort of lichens over it. And this diversity of the range of different lichens and, and the size of the different patches gives an indication that these have been around for a long time. It's taken a long time to get this, this pattern of age um, on it. 
And uh, we go even further back. So early Christian is only a thousand years. Well, I go back to to Stonehenge, which is apparently quite well known. It's a, a stone circle. It's about five thousand years old, and it's actually well known not to, just to archaeologists and just about everybody else on the planet, but it's well known to uh, lichenologists as being a very important site for for lichens. There's some pretty rare things that are found um, on Stonehenge. And one of the odd things, remember I was saying about that uh, seashore lichen, Ramelina siliquosa, which is all around the coast, and then there's these little patches inland. This is one of these patches inland. This is Ramelina siliquosa, a seashore lichen, that's probably best part of 50 miles inland. And this is one of the odd things about these uh, archeological monuments that have been sticking up into the air for thousands of years, they do seem to accumulate sort of a, a, a degree of sort of maritime like and sort of influence on them so they they they're a bit odd if you stick a rock in the air long enough it will get some of these marine lichens uh, on it but it's very very important site and in fact a lot of these old um, megalithic monuments are important for their lichens so back in the 70s there was some paint was daubed on some of these stones and the National Trust went to great lengths to actually try and remove the paint without damaging the lichens because of their importance. And uh, near to your home is um, uh, Kilmartin Glen in Argyll, which is a fantastic place. There's there's more archaeological monuments there than you can shake a stick at. They're just the place is thick with them. And this is a superb big slab of a quartzitic sandstone again sticking up in the air, and it's just covered with this superb mosaic. Of lichens and this sort of pattern sort of random pattern with quite big patches in places and the fact there's probably 25 30 lichens on there easily and that diversity is telling us that um the these have been there for a long time sort of sitting there in the landscape essentially just catching any lichen spore or lichen propagule one of those little patches of 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 algal cells and fungal cells being catching them as the wind blows them past. So they're great things for, for catching passing lichen propagules. And these are just some of the lichens that found on them. But then you go to somewhere like Callanish on the Isle of Lewis. And I was there back in 2011, I think it was, uh, with my good friend, Jeff. We were actually, it was a geological trip, but we went to Callanish. And as a lichenologist, I was really looking forward to it. I was thinking, fantastic. These stones will have been sticking up in the air for 5,000 years. They will be covered with an amazing assemblage of lichens. And I was so disappointed in that they effectively have been trashed. That at some point in the last sort of 30, 35 years, they have had all of their lichens removed. Um, they've been scrubbed clean. Now, the, the, there's a bit of Ramelina siliquosa is managing to recolonize a little bit of Xanthoria paritina there, but essentially they are, they are almost devoid of any lichen interest. And you can see there's little patches here, I think that's a thing called Rhizocarp and Petraeum, which is, and you can tell from the size of that little patch there that you know, they're struggling to recolonize it. And that patch tells me that this happened about 30 to 35 years ago. I'll say a little bit about dating rocks with using lichens in, in a book. But the great tragedy of this site is that it would have been covered with an amazing assemblage of things like the stones in Kalmartin Glen. Um, and they would have told people like me, which okay, well, I must be in a minority, but they would have screamed out that these are very, very old stones. Whereas now there is nothing there that tells me that these are more than 30 or 40 years old. There's nothing at all. Um, so I think a terrible, terrible, crime has been perpetrated um i shall never go back anyway so how fast do lichens grow this is one of the questions that people you often ask people often say lichens grow very very slowly and um for some of them that is actually true but it's not true for all of them so some grow very slow. So the crustose lichens, a lot of crustose lichens, like those ones that were struggling to get a foothold back on the canoe stones, grow pretty slowly, less than two millimetres per year. These sort of crustose lichens like this. This is one that grows on limestone. And it's called Aspacilia calcarea because it grows on calcareous rocks. And it grows pretty slowly. And so that, that blob there, that sort of circular one, I know that that started growing probably about 
about 60 or 70 years ago. There's been enough work done on these to work out the growth rate. What you do is um, the lichenologists that have come up with this lichenometry system go to, a, a, to graveyards or places where you know that a building or a headstone was installed. The headstones have a date on them, which is quite useful. And then you measure the lichens on them. And the, the largest ones you will assume settled soon after that headstone was there. And then you, if you get enough of these measured, you can, you can actually plot a, a graph and work out you know, the growth rate. And then you can measure these that like we see on that rock and uh, plot it against the graph and say, oh yes, that's 60 to 70 years old. But some lichens such as these, these are the reindeer lichens, the cladonias, and things that grow on trees grow quite a lot faster. They might be easily more than two centimeters a year. And if you're being munched by, like, uh, by reindeers fairly frequently, it's a good idea to be able to grow fairly fast, um, both for the lichens and for the reindeer. So some lichens do grow pretty fast, others are indeed very slow. And the slow ones uh, growing on rocks have been used for what we call lichenometry. And this is this Rhizocarpum geographicum again. And um, that it's, it's a very slow grower. And it's one of these ones that has a lot of work has actually been done to work out how long it takes to grow to a particular size. And there are sort of graphs that you can plot you, know, you measure how what diameter is, plot it on, on the graph, and, and it'll give you an approximation of when uh, this thing first started growing, which gives you a minimum age for how long that piece of rock has been exposed. But it's not an exact science at all. It's only a sort of rough estimate. What it's perhaps more useful for is uh, looking at a disturbance and, and how much people might have mucked around with things in the past. Like this is, these are the roll white stones in Oxfordshire. This is my son about 16 years ago now being introduced to the lichens of the roll white stones by my wife. And one of the things that was done in this paper was actually looking at the, the size of these various lichens on these stones and the diversity of the, the lichen flora and you could work out that some stones had been lying face down for quite a long period of time and then would have basically been just stood up again in the last 150 years or so. So it's, um, it's a useful technique, but it's not an exact science at all. Just useful for telling you how things might have been disturbed or roughly how long they've been exposed. And there's other things about... Uh, age and lichens. This brings me to the book, the title of the talk really, Trouble with Lichen, which is uh, a book by John Wyndham in 1960. And the basic premise was this, was that a chemical was extracted from lichens. It's found to slow the aging process. So some people could live to more than two centuries. And um, uh, there was a lot more to it than that. It was quite a lot of sort of intrigue and subterfuge and, and, uh, and people doing sort of generally bad things and, and ripping off the public and so on and so forth. Um, I haven't read it for many years myself, but there are other ways that lichens have been used to slow aging. I put it in the inverted commas because it didn't really sort of stop you getting older. One of them is um, these, some of these hairy lichens. This is, uh, this was up near Aberdeen. I saw this a good few years ago. I think called Briaria fuscescens, long thin strands, brown strands. And in the past, women would actually plait this into their hair and it would darken their hair a bit if they a blonde hair. And there's another sort called Alectoria, which is much paler, and you can map this into your hair to, to perhaps lighten your hair colour a little. So it's a bit, bit primitive, really. You know, it's not terribly effective. I don't think it's going to fool anybody, except at the distance. And then I came across this, lichen professional. I'm not entirely sure what it's about. Black hair returns soon. Um, weird. I don't know if there's anything to do with lichens in it. Um, and anyway, I'm sure this guy's really nice, but he looks a bit sinister to me. Anyway, so lichens have a sort of way of, of, of making you look younger, but not in any terribly convincing way. Are lichens useful? Well, if you're a model railway enthusiast, they're immensely useful. How would you make all these little trees and bushes and things like that? And you might think, well, that's a terrible abuse of lichens. But in fact, these things, the cladonias, um, the reindeer lichens, uh, they grow pretty fast, so the, uh, there's not enough railway enthusiasts out there to be a major cause of concern in terms of these things 
going extinct. There's an awful lot more reindeer out there eating them than there are uh, model railway enthusiasts making uh, trees out of them. They're uh, used quite a bit for homes and, and decorations, homes for small birds, because they're, they're actually very useful for knitting things together, particularly the stringy ones, things called usnia and such like. So they're amazingly useful for um, helping make nests. And of course, so they make nice sort of Christmas wreaths and, and things like that. Food. Well, you can, but I wouldn't recommend it. Um, there's a particular type of lichen called rock tripe, which we don't get anywhere in the UK. And it is eaten or has been eaten, we'll say, in Arctic regions. But frankly, it tastes horrible. Um, there's also a, a, an infusion of various lichens that I've uh, they make into a sort of tea in Germany. And I've tried that. And that indeed is truly awful as well. So don't really they're not, it's not worth it unless you're very, very desperate, unless you're up on a, a barren mountain top with nothing except rock tripe, I would avoid them. Um, but of course, they're important food for, for reindeer, the, the cladonias, the reindeer lichens. Um, but one of the problems there is that lichens, uh, like some other sort of plants like moss and such like, actually absorb um, certain compounds and particularly uh, radioactive materials. So Chernobyl, the Chernobyl disaster in 1986, scattered uh, a lot of radioactive material all over vast area and uh, cesium 137 is the main one that's the problem in the um in the cladonia and so even today you still have the the, the background levels in the cladonia and the reindeers are still uh, or the the level of radiation is is above the sort of normal background level so slightly hot food for reindeer but on a much smaller scale, um, and, and something you're more likely to see than reindeer, well, this time of year you might see more reindeer than usual, uh, things called orobated mites. And within uh, little patches of lichens, particularly the folios, the, the kind of leafy lichens, you'll, 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 there's a whole little sort of ecosystem, tiny ecosystem, um, living its life out there. And one of the key crit critters in it is these things, these what's called orobated mites, which are like little tiny critters that are kind of crawling around. So if you if you um, build up a collection of, of lichens, you will inevitably find some of these little things crawling out, sort of wondering, where, where am I? Um, so lovely little things. I know nothing about orobated mites. That's a whole separate subject. But they're nice things to see. So we've had sort of uh, aspects of sort of food and in eating things, if you really must. But there's also uh, ways of killing things. And you can kill bacteria for instance, uh, using uh, a substance called usnic acid, which comes from a lichen called usnia, which is one of these stringy lichens, very common um, uh, in parts of Scotland. And uh, it's an antibacterial and it's been quite widely used for, for a long time, you know, sort of curries and such like where sometimes the meat was a bit iffy. But of course, people get more uh, aware of what things are and just because it's natural doesn't mean to say that it's necessarily good for you. I'm not saying either way, but there are these concerns. Is usnic acid safe for side effects? So, but it's one of these things, it's an antimicrobial that's been used for a long time, you know, long before people really realized uh, you know, what it was. They were just using the, the lichen. You can kill much bigger things. There's a thing called Lotharia vulpina, which is sometimes called wolf lichen. But in fact, uh, vulpina means fox. Vulpes vulpes is the fox. So it's killed. It's used for killing foxes as much as as killing wolves. You might think lichen killing something like a wolf. But bear in mind that they are fungi, and there are some fungi, uh, well-known fungi, things like death cap and destroying angel. Where there's a, there's a clue in the name there. These are very very toxic. Uh, toadstools and so in some of the a few of the lichens including this particular one the the fungal partner is actually pretty pretty toxic and it's thought it's actually it's a the main algal fungus fungal partner is one of these jelly fungi but it's also got another partner in there one of these basidium mycete yeasts and that's the thing that's doing the wolf killing so don't eat this one Although you won't have much of a chance because unfortunately it doesn't occur anywhere in the UK, even in Scotland, beautiful though it is. But 
other things, not just killing things, you can make things smell nice, lichens and perfume. This is a thing called a Vernia pronastri, which is a very common lichen. Um, and it's one of these kind of um, shrubby sort of lichens. And the key thing about it is on the upper surface, it's a sort of greeny color and a bit kind of wrinkled. And the undersurface is much paler, sometimes almost white. And so that is a Vernia prunastri. And it's very often called oak moss, even though it's not a moss. And it's harvested in um, parts of southern France, and it might be harvested from the trees two or three times a year. So that's telling you how fast this thing grows. And an extract from it is used in expensive perfumes where it has a, a sort of a fixative. It means that the scent lingers longer, much longer than it would do without this sort of fixative. But again, there's the issue that as soon as people start analysing, they think, oh, well, is this good for people? You know, there might be um, allergic reactions or whatever. So there's been suggestions there might be a ban on um, the use of this oak moss, this Avernia prunastri. And then litmus paper, lichens and litmus paper and drink. This is uh, this is the Isle of Portland, which is a fantastic place for lichens. It's a fantastic place for fossils as well, actually, but it's a fantastic place for lichens. It really is, but it's an awfully long way from um, northern Scotland. This is a big limestone boulder here and encrusting bits of this are this um, rather strange kind of pinky purpley kind of lichen, which is called Roxella phycopsis, or sometimes called Orchella. It's got a common name. It's one of those rare things, a lichen with a common name. And Roxella phycopsis or Orchella, um, basically you, you boil up a, a sort of big infusion of this, this lichen, uh, and then you create this kind of infusion and then you soak strips of paper in it and then that is used as litmus paper and of course you remember from uh, uh, school days litmus paper is that stuff that you stick in in a liquid to see if it's acid or alkaline uh, is it red for acid blue for alkaline so that's ultimately where the uh, litmus paper chemical comes from it comes from a lichen okay so what's that got to do with booze with drink particularly whiskey with or without an e in it um it's the irish whiskey has an e in it and the scottish whiskey does not i think that's all irish there but anyway the reason that it's all irish is because uh roxella occurs around the sort of various rocky parts of the south coast of england so dorset devon cornwall silly isles um parts of the welsh coast as well south wales and such like so there is an expectation that it should also occur somewhere on the southwest coast of Ireland, where there is more than enough rock to support uh, this lichen. And many years ago, probably at least 50 years ago now, the um, British Lichen Society Committee decided that you know, whosoever should find be the first person to find Roxella in Ireland could claim a bottle of whiskey. And that bottle is still waiting. Nobody has found it. It's one of those odd things. You think it should be there. It should be, uh, you know, conditions would seem to be right for it um, in terms of rocky coasts, south facing, nice and sunny. Um, but it has not been found and that's not for want of looking. So if you find it, make your claim. OK, indicators of air quality. A lot of people are very, very familiar with the fact that lichens are supposedly a good indicator of air quality. If there's lots of lichens around, then it means the air quality is good. And that's not strictly true. What it, it really, the lichens, uh, what you need to look for is, is there a diversity of different lichens rather than is there a lot of them? If, there, if there's just a lot of one or two species, then things are not that great. And this notion of, of lichens and air quality comes from really the kind of 1960s and 70s when um, a lot of the industrial heartlands of Britain would have looked like this, an awful lot of factory chimneys pouring out sulfur dioxide and, and lichens and fungi and mosses and such like do not like sulfur dioxide at all. So effectively it killed pretty much everything. And so this was a map that was produced probably in the in the 60s. And it shows these areas, crusty lichens or no lichens, high level of atmospheric pollution. There's really precious little at all in these areas. And you had to go quite a distance to get back to where you had the reasonable diversity of crusty, leafy, shrubby and hairy lichens, where there was little atmospheric uh, pollution. 
And the thing that was abundant in those really polluted areas was a thing called Lecanora canisioides. And it was called the pollution lichen because in some parts of the English Midlands, it was the only thing you were going to find. And it loved sulfur dioxide. And you might think, well, what did it do before the Industrial Revolution? Well, volcanoes. Volcanoes tend to produce quite a lot of sulfur dioxide. So before the Industrial Revolution, this would have been a rare species that was just found around sort of active volcanoes that were spewing out sulfur dioxide. And then um, mid uh, 18th century industrial revolution, huge amounts of sulfur dioxide. And this one thought, whee, and off it went and it conquered the industrial world. Um, but now it's gone into sort of steep decline. It's one of those things you really don't see very often at all now because air quality has changed. It's not necessarily better, but there's much less sulfur dioxide. And this was, brings us to the today's atmospheric pollution, which is ammonia, uh, NH3. And most of that comes from uh, agricultural activities, uh, muck spreading and uh, uh, nitrogen fertilizers and such like. And it is a really big problem. It is, a, it is a health issue that most people are quite, quite unaware of, but it is not good at all. And when we look, this is a map of uh, you, you people up there, you, I think you're, you're up there somewhere. I think you're fine. It's pretty good up there, but you go further south and it gets really pretty desperate. You go to some parts of the, you know, northern England and such like, and you go over to Northern Ireland and it's there's sort of desperate levels of, of far, far too much nitrogen. And that has a major effect on an awful lot of things, um, particularly the lichens. And we see this, you can see it in terms of the lichens. This is this is my home village uh, in Gloucestershire. And if I'd been wandering around this 50 years ago, it would have looked nothing like this. This is really developed in the last 30 or 40 years. And the trees are just dominated by just two or three species. Think called Xanthoria parietina, this bright orange thing, and a couple of species of thing called Fissia, which is this gray thing. And they love nitrogen. Uh, and so they just, outcompete everything else and a lot of the other lichens don't like nitrogen don't like ammonia and so they just give up and, and die so you end up with um, loads of lichens but it's all a bit boring because it's just these two or three species that like ammonia and they are a, an indication of how bad things are getting or have got and there's a, a lichen identification guide you can download this thing which actually will help you in a some simple way to figure out how good or bad the air quality is the pollution gang, nitrogen loving things, Anthorium, Fissia, and at the other end, you've got the, the clean team, which is Osnea, Vernia, and Hypergymnia. So you'll see a lot of these where you are, and you'll see a little bit of these, but not so much. And you'll see some of these as well. Climate change, I should say something about climate change. Um, although, as a geologist, geologists, when people say climate change, we just say, well, yes, it does, because over time, climate does change. But I think the climate change at the moment is definitely anthropogenic. This is a thing called Flavoparmelia ceridians, a bit of a mouthful. And this uh, was its distribution in 1994. It's a thing that loves nice, warm, sunny weather. It's really, it's a Mediterranean thing. It just creeps into the extreme south of England. And there's, there was one dot from Crom in, uh, in County Fermanagh back by 1994. But now this is 2014. So this is seven years on and there's a lot more records since then. You can see it's, it is spread northwards, and it's not just a case of people have not spotted it before. These are a lot of these are new records. You can tell by the, the fact that the size of these things are not terribly big. They've quite newly um, arrived. So I remember I found it on this little spot here. I found it there in 1998, and I was very excited by it then. But it's turned out it's, it's spreading northwards because the climate is warming and it's much more favourable for it. Right, get towards the end now. Uh, water quality, I should say something about water quality. There's a whole little subsection of lichens that grow or thrive within the zone of seasonal flooding of rivers. So in the winter, the river level will be up here. And in the, in the summer, it might be even a bit lower than this. And there are lichens that just live within this zone. So they only get uncovered really during the summer. So you can't see them in the winter. And uh, this is, uh, there's several different sorts here. There's this sort of kind of um leafy one here and there's another darker leafy one there this black here is another crusty type one there's another one there so the whole little community and if you have a very clean river that's been 
had clean water all the time, it's never suffered a pollution event, then you will expect to find really quite a nice diverse lichen floor. And then my favorite group, they're quite tricky. This is not a group to start uh, at the beginning. Start with the seashore lichens. Do not start with these. These can be a nightmare. But I love them. And uh, this is a fantastic river. This is in County Antrim, the Glenarm River. And it really, really is exceptional. And it quite clearly has never suffered a significant pollution event at all. But unfortunately, it is in the minority. This is what so many rivers look like. This is the result of agricultural effluent just going into a river. And effectively, you've just got these kind of bacterial and fungal slimes. And it, it kills the lichens and it kills pretty much everything. And once you've had an event like this go through a river, it wipes things out and it takes a long time for things to sort of recolonize. So you can go to a river and it looks fine, but you'll only find perhaps one or two fairly common lichen species in that seasonal flooding zone. And so you know that at some point in the past, it has actually suffered a significant pollution event, which is a terrible shame but there's loads of loads of rivers actually up in Scotland that are still fantastic for the lichens because they have not been polluted it's too remote from intensive agriculture and um so this is me my getting on my uh, my hobby horse here this is something I find annoying people protesting against pollution they protest against fracking will poison our land air and water this is in Northern Ireland in County Tyrone where they're complaining about there's a gold mine going to be opening it will pollute our water and so on and so forth I'm not in favour of fracking or gold mining but what I do find uh, galling is these people are complaining yeah they're protesting against it will poison our land air and water no your air land and water has been poisoned for decades and you've not noticed look here's this Santoria the air, air is poisoned here's this river full of that uh, ghastly sort of slime. So I think the message needs to get out here that, that a lot of poisoning has already happened and this is not gonna make a, a whole heap of difference. Wind, woodland continuity, I just wanna say a bit about woodlands. Um, a lot of uh, ecologists and such like, they go to woods and they use the flowering plants as indicators of ancient woodland. So this is the wood anemone, which is a beautiful flower and it's used as an indicator of ancient woodland. Ancient woodland is woodland that has been there for several hundred years. Um, and here are wood anemones. On the, this is Belfast down here. These are the Belfast Hills. Here are, there's a nice spread of wood anemones on the Belfast Hills. And we know that there's indeed no woodland up here for a long, long time. So this is not <clears throat> an indicator of ancient woodland at all. And this is another bit of is it ancient woodland? This is uh, Port Glenone, again in, uh, in County Antrim. Beautiful bluebell spread. The woodland ecologists will say, oh, well, this must be ancient woodland because it has these bluebells you know, in such abundance. But the thing is that the bluebells and wood anemones in climates like you get in Scotland and, and Ireland, they don't mind if the trees aren't there. They will survive for many, many decades. So you can clear all the trees and the bluebells and such like will stay there. And then the trees grow up decades later uh, people come along and say oh it's ancient woodland and it's not ancient woodland because these things have survived in the absence of trees but the lichens if you got ancient woodland indicated lichens on the trees and you clear all the trees that's it when the trees grow up again they cannot uh they won't have these ancient woodland lichens because those lichens are very very slow to recolonize so just a little bit about lichen weeds. These are the things you see all over the place. Uh, very, very common, very quick to spread. They spread very widely and very quickly. We've seen some of these before. You'll see them sort of all over the place. And these are the ancient woodland lichens. These are very slow to sort of migrate. Even within a woodland, they don't actually manage to colonize a new tree for a long, long time. Um, so these are the sorts of things you will find in some of the wet woodlands up in uh, Western Scotland or such like, and they are an indicator that there's been woodland continuity. There have been trees, it, not necessarily big trees, it could just be hazel scrub, they've been there for a long time, there's been this continuity, there's not been a period when they've cleared all the trees or woodland, uh, hazel scrub has been cleared. And this is a thing from down in the south of England, much drier environments, these are called pinhead lichens, because they look a little bit like a pinhead, and again these are an indicator of, of woodland that has been there for for hundreds of years, if you've got a, a good diversity of these pinhead lichens, it tells you that this it really is 
ancient woodland. So ignore all those bluebells and wood anemones. They're giving you a, a, a false story. So ancient trees are irreplaceable. So the government's always saying, oh, well, we'll clear all these trees. We'll give you twice as many than an adjacent patch. And you think that's, you know, that doesn't you know, cut the message. That's like with this, um, this is Devonish Island again, which I did like and survey on a couple of years ago, early Christian site. It's like saying, well, we'll bulldoze all these ancient monuments, thousand year old monuments, but we'll rebuild them on the next island out of breeze blocks. That's the same sort of thing. It's, you cannot replace uh, ancient woodland. And the more that is lost, the more difficult it is for existing woodlands to acquire some of these ancient sort of lichen and bryophytes as well, because the the whole ecosystem in the UK is very, very fragmented now. It can be a long jump between one bit of ancient woodland and another bit of woodland. So it can be a real struggle for these things to actually. Um, and don't get me started on HS2. Oh dear. Anyway, so that's cutting down still more ancient woodland. Um, Scotland's rainforest. Scotland is internationally important for lichens and it, it really is fantastic and it has these rainforests, temperate rainforests, there are no orangutans or tapirs or tigers or anything like that and we don't want them because they might eat you, but it has fantastic sort of lichens and, and Argyle is particularly splendid for them. This is, uh, this is some of the rainforest lichens in, in Napdale, the place where the beavers live, and it's just amazing place i would be so excited to see even a fragment of one of these and they're just covering all the trees just like weeds this kind of leaden gray sort of color and these things that look like big chunk yeah you know, big bits of cabbage stuck on trees just absolutely amazing um uh so these west of scotland is really very very important for the rainforest and there's about thirty thousand hectares left which apparently is about the size of edinburgh but to my mind much better than edinburgh so it really is um, very, very important because there's so little of it left and it's a bit fragmented and also it's under threat. There's a thing called the Alliance for Scotland's Rainforest, which some of you may have be familiar with. But there's big problems. There's invasive species. There's a whole range of invasive species. Uh, there's these critters, um, which are a pain. Far, far too many deer. So they're munching all the trees. So you're not getting any new growth. The, the, the old growth trees are just getting older and older and older. Um, and so until something is done about this um, deer problem, uh, I don't know what's what the future holds really. Last time I was in Scotland, almost every time I stopped and looked in the ditch, there was a dead deer in it. So there's far too many of them up there. And another one of the big threats is rhododendron, which does look beautiful, but it really is a, is a killer for so many things because it, it blocks out so much light. Uh, and a lot of these wooden lichens can tolerate fairly low levels of light, but not as low as you get in, in um, rhododendrons. And, and it's been said there's a big problem in Ireland as well, and it's been said that the only way to deal with it in Ireland is to call in the military. Not, not to shoot the rhododendron, because that wouldn't be very effective, but just in terms of getting people on the ground to actually deal with it. It is a really, really big problem in, in Scotland and Ireland. And these are some of the fantastic rainforest lichens. This is one I was to say about this story. Um, many years ago, I was up in the Burren on the west of Ireland and I was actually helping a load of other caving friends of mine because I'm a caver as well. And we were digging out this cave. Um, there's a pothole actually. And I was up at the top just waiting to be given the call to haul the bucket up full of mud and rocks. And there were all these little bushes around me. And I saw this thing. I thought, oh my goodness, it's Pseudocyphalaria cricata. And it was. It was the it was only the second record for Ireland, and I spotted it while I was doing something completely different. And this is another great thing, Liberia pulmonaria, beautiful, beautiful lichens. And there, the Scottish rainforests are a real stronghold for, for these and others. But I say that the, the west of Scotland, the west of Ireland is really good for these rainforest lichens. And then every now and then something really remarkable happens. And this happened to me. This is a place called South Woodburn Glen, which is about 15 kilometres east of Belfast, uh, near Carrick Fergus, made famous by the song. And um, I went up there, I was actually looking at the geology. I wasn't looking really for lichens and I was wandering along and on one of the crags, there was lots and lots of this sort of, sort of kind of browny sort of thing with these little tiny leafy bits, bright yellowy green leafy bits. And I thought, oh my goodness, it's a thing called Stichter canariensis. 
and it's one of these hyper oceanic lichens it grows in the rainforest so here you can see it west coast of scotland you see it over in the few places in the west of ireland a handful of places in the west of wales and, and england and then carrick fergus so it was so totally unexpected it's still the most remarkable thing i've ever found whilst lichenizing and yet it has survived you know a couple of centuries of pretty intensive pollution from Belfast industry, which would have been coming from west to east. But this is a very deep sort of gorge. Just upstream is a big waterfall. So this whole kind of gorge is kind of infused with this fine spray of water droplets. And I think that is what actually has kept this thing alive and protected it from the, the predations of the atmospheric pollution that was kind of being blown across the top of this gorge. So it just goes to show that don't just think oh well they're not going to find anything there at all you just never know until you look what you might actually find so i think i'd call it uh, uh i'll finish there i just i say really that lichens are everywhere they have the uh great advantage that they stay still they don't jump around or fly off like animals and birds and things do so they're great um subjects for photography and some of them are sort of very beautiful they're very diverse in their shapes and colors and such like and start with some of the sort of simpler ones the more common ones and particularly rocky shores is a great place to start um, because there's quite a bit being sort of written about those uh, and just gradually add you know one more to your uh bow as it were each day there's a few um uh, things that i would recommend during the british lichen society uh, be very very helpful um, there's a couple of lichenologists in Scotland, uh, Brian and Sandy Coppins, who are astonishingly knowledgeable and also uh, been very, very helpful to lichenologists, many generations of sort of lichenologists. Um, there's a thing called Lichen Spotters uh, UK, which is kind of aimed quite at sort of beginners and they sort of send in uh, pictures and, and us sort of experts try and identify them. And of course, Scottish lichens, which is, is great, which is run by Petra. And I think um, you know, I contribute to that. And it's great to see some of the things that, that people find in Scotland, you know, things that I've never seen. And then there's another one which is like an identification, but that's a US based one. So it has stuff from all over the place, which is where my big volume on North American lichens occasionally gets gets an airing. So so like I say, certainly I would say sign up for the um, the Facebook pages and, and see what uh, you know, if you've got things you think, well, what's this? Just post it and, and we will do our utmost to help. So, okay, I shall stop sharing now. Happy to answer any questions. Um, oh, there's actually, um, there's a couple of, uh, what do lichens use all their special chemicals for? Well, that's a good question. The, uh, the, us uh, the, uh, Yes, it was azonic acid, wasn't it, which is the antimicrobial. So probably the, the lichens are actually using that chemical to stop themselves being um, predated by microbes. So it is, it's a protection against uh, other things having a go at them to some extent. Um, and to try and off, to put things off eating them, if you taste horrible, doesn't need to put reindeer off. Um, but a lot of them we don't know. They're just they're just there we don't know quite what they might be used for and somebody said uh Rose said were the cash stones covered in peat they were covered in peat up to about a meter above the present level uh the peat's been cut down um but there was a, a there was still like quite a bit sticking out above the surface um the fact that they scrubbed all the lichens off meant that that, that peat line Below the peats, the lichens would have been much smaller and less diverse. And above the line, they would have been more diverse. So you would have seen that peat line recorded in the, in the lichens on them. But by scrubbing them clean, you've, you've erased all that part of the history. I just think it's absolute tragedy. But I've seen it in Ireland. Um, the Dukas, who are the environment people, they did it with a, another early Christian site over in the west of Ireland on uh, Inish Murray. Uh, and they went around with kind of herbicide, just spraying it all. And you could see that they weren't tall enough to reach the very highest bits. So the lichens were still alive above the above all these dead lichens. I was there probably just a few months after they sprayed it. But yes. So any more?
Hello. 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 I've, um, I've seen on my window ledge a, a, a nest which I picked up this year with lichens on it. You're just talking about lichens. Oh, yeah. Yes, that's there's... Palma, tre Palma Trema pelatum on the other side. The bit I can see is Palma Trema pelatum. I'm pretty sure of that, yes. I think it's all the same one. Yeah. Would that have just been picked up with whatever vegetation the bird was? No, they could collecting. quite, they, they might well have actually deliberately picked, picked it. Because I think some birds do deliberately, they think, oh, this stuff's useful, I'll use some of this. <laughs> So it is. Oh. So it's not. It's not random at all. You know, you see some nests, uh, and the fact that you know it seems all Palmelia pelata, Palma trema pelata. You know that that particular bird. Obviously, that's their favourite lichen. Right. Right. Okay. Hey, Tim yeah. had a question. Tim. Tim, you. Were... Yes. Um, I was just, uh, to follow on from the sort of thing about um, unusual chemicals. Uh, do they have much more complex metabolism in some ways? Um, skills at breaking down minerals or getting things out of bare rock in a way that other plants and certainly animals can't do that? Well, that's uh, that's a that's a very good question because one of the things that is often said about lichens, and this crops up in terms of stone weathering on ancient monuments, things like that, and and so the um, lichenologists often say, well, no, no, there's they don't. They don't extract anything from the rock. They're just using its substrate to sit on. But that cannot be the case because a lot of them are rather substrate specific. There's particular rocks they they will be on or they won't be on. Um, and there is a certain degree of metabolism going on in the rocks because some of them actually they release um, on on some rocks that are fairly well iron rich. They contain iron silicate minerals and. You will see this sometimes. It'll be a big sort of white patch on a rock, and you'll see a rusty streak underneath it. And so they've effectively they've taken the iron out of these delicate minerals, and then they've kind of released it, and it's got this streak sort of running down. Uh, but I, I must admit that the like metabolism. I'm more a sort of field like analogist. Like metabolism is sort of that's a whole there's a whole labs and things doing stuff on that you know there's a, there's an awful lot more to be found because as i said they're a cinderella group there's not huge numbers of people working on them mm. but... thanks has anyone else got any questions um i'd just like a little bit more about um how they absorb nutrients on trees as it seems to be uh, affected by the, the kind of the tree and its moisture content and the rainfall on it. Yeah, the, again, it's one of these things that you read as a lichen, which they say, oh no, the, the lichen is just using the, the hyphae are attaching to the bark or the rock or whatever, but it's not actually interacting. But to my mind, it must be because they are, they can be tree specific. Um, there's a, there's a, a lichen called Gyalecta ulmi, and there's a clue in the name there. Its favourite tree was the elm. Now that wasn't a good move, was it? <laughs> so it's actually a few of them have survived on on sycamore and ash, but but some are really quite specific. There's another one that only grows um, Agonimia tristicular, which only grows on elder. Um, but what's exactly going on there? I don't know. Uh, yes, you, you're saying that it's there's degrees of you know how much moisture is there within the bark. So elder bark is going to be a bit different from say oak or ash or um and then the roughness of the bark is also another thing so beech generally tends to be a bit rubbish even though it's got beautifully smooth bark you think it'd be really good for sticking lichens on but it's it's not um thanks Any other questions? I was going to say there's a uh, books. Oh, where has it gone? Can't find it there. Um, oh, good book. Good books to get for. Oh, I got to rummage around in my. Uh, there's um, there's a couple of good books that are 
would be. This one is actually, it's uh, it's lichens of Ireland. It's actually quite difficult to get hold of now, but um, it's actually really quite nicely done. And it's got a lot of the things that you would get in Scotland are, are, are in Ireland as well. So that's by Paul Whelan. But it's, alas, it's out of print. So lichens of Ireland. And um, there's another one, which is a, a jolly good read, um, The Lichen Hunters. Um, by is it Oliver Gilbert, and it talks about some of the adventures of uh, you would have thought who like an just having adventures where well, they did, um, particularly and it talks quite a bit about Scotland because you've got um, I mentioned Ben Laws. Ben Laws is one of those places that I've, I have mixed feelings. I would like to go there because it's got a fantastic lichen uh, assemblage there. But then I wouldn't like to go there because I wouldn't know what any of these things are because <laughs> they're so different. It's it's a really, really kind of special place is Ben Laws. Um, and there's a few other places, um, you know, around Scotland where things, you know, really only found there. So, um, well, we're feeling there's another one. Um, that, that rather begs the question of why is Ben Laws so special? Oh, it's the geology. The geology, it's um, it's a fairly yes, kind of okay. piece of calcareous rock. So you you talk to any of the botanists, and the botanists will say, "Oh, Ben Laws." Um, even talk to the geologists, and say, "Oh, Ben Laws, Ben Laws." <laughs> it's it's high. I don't know how high it is. It's pretty high. It's got a combination of altitude and quite basic geology, kind of calcareous mm -hmm. geology, and that's really you don't get most of the the high mountains in Scotland and elsewhere are quite siliceous rocks. And so they support particular assembly <laughs> lichens, but the things you're seeing in uh, on Ben Laws are the things you might see in some of the, you know, some of the alpine mountains, you know, lime, high altitude limestone. So um, there's a new naturalist book on lichens as well, which uh, um, that's Oliver Gilbert as well, um, which is uh, quite nice, and that goes through all the different habitats as well. I mean, it's a, when you read it, it's actually got lots and lots of lists of Latin names. They might, Ugh, goodness me. But it's actually, it's a useful clue as to what to look for, um, yeah, in particular places. So it's, uh, I think new naturalists are now much easier to obtain than they used to be. It used to be a case of the hardback would come out and it would all sell out within a couple of weeks. <laughs> but now I think you'd get them on demand. So... <laughs> There's new naturalist people, but there were people who just collect new naturalist books. They have no interest in the subject. They just collect the books. Mike, you did say about starting up the coast, which doesn't suit me because I'm 50 miles away from the coast. Because oh. a lot of people are around in Vaness. If you want to get started on something really cheap, there's these field study yes. capital sheets, which are just photographs and a little key. And they only cost about three pounds. There's all sorts of them, but this one's Guide to Rocky Shore Lichens. So I think if you just wanted a cheap <coughs> in and matching photographs, that's maybe quite a good one to start with. And I think you can pick them up even for less than three pounds if you look on eBay. Yes, or... there are. There are actually, and there's some, I think there's at least two now that are kind of lichens on twigs. Yes. So, yes. and um, then there's, there's some that have been done, which is about the. Oh, goodness, I'm going to have to rummage. Um, about lichens in the uh, Atlantic rainforest, but can I find them? No, I probably can't. Oh dear, my uh, Yeah, they're available online from Plant Life Free if you oh, yeah, yes. have it printed out. So that's yes, a cheap actually. way in. <laughs> Here they, here they are. This is uh, lichens of Welsh Atlantic woodlands, but they're the same things in Scotland. It's uh, plant life, yeah, Welsh Atlantic woodlands, but Scotland's just the same, but just much, much better, um, we'll say. Oh, there's uh, bryophytes, oh, we're still about that, liverworts. Then there's, uh, yeah, lichens of Atlantic woodlands, yeah, plant life. Um, guide two, lichens on the birch. And then there's, uh, there's another one, which is uh, Field Studies Council on things on twigs. So there's a lot of just sort of Google around and there's a lot of, um, yeah, there's a lot of helpful information without actually forking out on the books. The problem with the, the books, which is this, uh, this is the field guide, the lichen by Frank Dobson, 
not the Labour or politician. I don't think he's a politician anymore. Anyway, um, this is Lycan's Field Guide, but it's expensive. And it's one of those things that it's very useful when you know it, what it is you're looking at. But as a starter guide, it, it's, it can be a bit off-putting. So I start with some of those, um, those leaflets because they're actually, you, you can get a lot of the way with those. And then if there's something you're not kind of happy with, just stick it on the, the Facebook page. Say, well, what's this? And, and we'll have a go. And, and whenever I answer things, I try and say why it is that I think it is that thing. He, these are the key features that you, you, you want to look for. Well, Mike, I don't live 50 miles from the coast and I'm going to Rosemarkey Beach tomorrow, walking along the shore for about two miles. So I shall look for lichens and photograph them and try and identify them. So my knowledge of lichens has gone from less than a postage stamp to, well, maybe the side, the side of an envelope. Postcard. So, uh, yes. <laughs> yes, like I say, the the the, the um the the seashore ones are good in that you could almost like uh, you know make make a list and then go look and you'll you'll find them. So you'll find Ramelina siliquosa, and down on the shore you'll find Vericaria mara, and then you'll find green sort of spots, dark green spots, Vericaria mucosa. So um, yeah, seashore is great. It's it's difficult if you're fifty miles from the sea. Yes. <laughs> Yes, yes. Or if your also, bit of coast is not that great, because I live, uh, the sea's only kind of a kilometre away, but it's, the rocks are rubbish. So it's not really very much. Oh, well. Right, well, if well, that's thanks. all the questions, I think I'd like to say thank you very much, Mike. I think you've um, inspired us all to go out and look a bit more closely. I, I live in in the Cairngorms and I've got the problem that there's so many lichens that I've got no idea what they are. Everyone says, how lucky you are. And no, <laughs> <laughs> it's not lucky because you just see too many things and you're not yeah, sure what I, they I are. I do appreciate your plight, yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I suppose a lot of people might like that plight. <laughs> yes, yes. But uh, thank you very much for stepping in and giving us such an interesting talk. And I, Audrey normally pops these things on um, YouTube eventually, um, if you're happy with that. Yeah, yeah. Like I say, this is, is very similar to the the one I did for the Kate Ness thing. So it's um, it's sort of already there, but yeah, I don't mind. Yes. Yeah. Excellent.